Okay, good morning. Thank you for uh, uh, being here at class. We are at our week 10 of our course in uh, Christian counseling. Thank you for all those who joined in um, yeah, on, on, on the live stream, uh, as well as those who have uh, who've later been seeing this video. Thank you for your diligence. Thank you for uh, keeping uh, in touch with the course. We have just a couple more of weeks to go. Um, by the end of April, we will be done with this course. So we've, uh, we're moving into the latter half of the course. So um, up until now, um, if if you have been following closely with the with the entire course, we we initially looked at um, uh, uh, we, we started looking at different kinds of um, things about counseling. We started with an introduction. We looked at uh, the perspective of the personality of man, or how do we understand human needs with uh, with a with a biblical perspective. Then we started straight away into what actually happens in counseling. And some of the things that we've seen are important is the counseling relationship, that is the relationship with the counselor as well as the counseling. And within this relationship, there is a process that happens. Um, we studied three processes, that is uh, um, exploration, understanding, and getting into action. And through these processes, we also looked at certain skills that the counselor needs to have in order to uh, go on with counseling. So the chart over here, uh, in short, depicts, um, uh, it, it gives you a, a good idea. It, it uh, brings about the very stages that both the counselor and the counseling passes pass through during the counseling process. So you would see that this is based a lot on the attitudes of the counselor as well as the skills of the counselor, which helps in the learning process of the counseling, which is actually the stages of the counseling relationship. So the attitudes that are um, take adopted by the counselor, as we have seen, is empathy, unconditional positive regard, and congruence or genuine genuineness. Now, these are needed to create and sustain that atmosphere of trust, atmosphere of respect that will in turn encourage the person to be open to the counselor as well as to come to a place of uh, personalizing whatever the, uh, the problems or the issues are and moving them into a place of action. So during the initial stage, the counselor attends to the counseling and that affects directly affects the involvement of the counselee in the counselling process. Now, once you see that the counselee is involved, that's when we move into the next stage, now, which is the exploration. But uh, for that to happen, the skills of responding of the counsellor is what stimulates that place of self-exploration in the counselling. Now, this uh, this deepens the self-exploration um, in the in the counselling and then it enables the counselling process to pass on to the next stage which is the personalising stage. The personalising stage is where the counselling takes onus or takes responsibility for their contribution in their concern or in their problem. So the personalising skills that the counsellor stimulates brings about an understanding of one of, of themselves the, of the counseling in the um, in the process of the counts, uh, counseling um, uh, in, in the stages of the counseling now this understanding makes it possible for the process to move into the next stage which is the stage of initiative where the counselor is bringing them to a place of readiness or a place of preparedness where the counselee takes relevant action, and uh, uh, and it, that gets formulated into solving the counselee's problem. Okay, so the, when you look at this entire chart, this is what um, this is in a nutshell 
what you're looking at. In uh, It is the counseling model. You're looking at the skills that the counselor requires and what is the uh, counselor's learning process. So once the action takes place, then there is a mechanism of feedback as well as evaluation. Now, sometimes this can keep going over and over again, depending on the issues that the counselor wants to work in or the goals or the objectives that the counselor may have. These, this process may, may repeatedly go a couple of times, okay? So this is where we, we, uh, we, this is still where we completed. And this part is a lot, the nuts and bolts of counseling. And it, it you know, it, it was just packaged in a, in, in really fast terms. Um, there are, there are years and years of study that people actually just take in learning to be more skilled and to, to work through these processes, okay? But as for our course and as for um, for those of us who are here, it is to give you a broader idea. And uh, you know, you take this as as an appetizer and go in to really delve more if you you know if you do feel you would like to learn and understand more. And there are multiple courses that's available uh, outside over different in different organizations that you could actually do that okay so we we complete this uh, this part of our lesson uh, and we move into the next uh, next part which which is what we um, what we're going to be focusing is on um, uh, different issues in in counseling what are the some of the issues that may come up that we need to be aware of um, and uh, we will look at a few in the upcoming uh, upcoming classes. We may not be able to um, share every every aspect of um, issues that come up in counseling rooms or in pastoral care. But I've just taken up um, some broad areas so that uh, we have we have a good understanding of it. And um, uh, so for the topic for today, the particular issues in counseling that we're going to be looking at uh, for today's class is mental health as well as uh, marriage and family related issues. So I may just touch and go on a lot of this. Um, it's not in depth. It's just to give you like a taste of uh, what it is and what we need to be aware of. We need to be um, not be ignorant that there are issues like this that happen. And we need to deal with some of the problems up front. So it is, it's to give you a real taste into, uh, into these, uh, these um, concerns. Okay. Now, even as I'm going through this, uh, this class, I wanted to make it a little bit interactive because otherwise it's just one person talking. And so I have a couple of slides where I've spoken about um, uh, whether some of some of these issues that you know about in mental health is whether it's a myth or whether it's a fact, okay? And uh, I'm going to be putting up some of this and I'd like, you know, you know it would be nice if you all could just unmute and respond so that, you know, we make the class a little bit more interactive and uh, brings about some learning, okay? So let's move, let's uh, start with first. Uh, so this is just a little bit of reflection that I want you to uh, recall. The first thing that I'd like you to do, do is, um, Think about one positive emotion or feeling that you experienced. So any time in the past, think about um, one situation. So the first and the second question I'm clubbing together. What happened? What happened in a certain situation that made you have this positive emotion or feeling that you experienced? Right? So this is just a, uh, this is just a personal reflection. It can be any situation that you have faced, that you have seen, that has, that has uh, given you a very positive emotion or feeling. Would one or two of you just like to quickly, um, let's not waste time, quickly just unmute, talk. You can briefly talk about the situation and what emotion you experienced. Yes? This is not a question answer. This is something that in your life you must have experienced some uh, situation that you have experienced an emotion. Yes, waiting for responses.
Come on. Even if you can just put it down on the chat, that is, that's fine too. I think now I need to call out names, otherwise people may not respond. Um, who shall I call out? Anita. Anita, would you like to share some some situation that's happened and a positive emotion that's uh, that you felt as a result? Anita, are you there? Okay, maybe somebody else, uh, Leah, Leah Lama, or Laya Lama. I'm sorry if I haven't pronounced your name right. Laya Lama. Okay, maybe I will start. Yes, Subhashish, thank you. Yes. I think I recall when uh, uh, I got the first division in matric exam. I think mm -hmm. uh, in all uh my school i think only four students uh we got the first position and that very moment i think uh, the strangers also they came uh, to our house and they congratulate me and mm -hmm. uh, from our actually uh christian uh, background also only person i also i was really that time uh, very happy that okay those people they don't know me uh, they come and congratulate and uh, even I think uh, that uh, month I think I think uh, we have distributed many switch to the strangers also because uh, it was a, a joyful moment for uh, me and the, for my school even for my family as well as for the church also. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's really nice. Okay. Yeah. So as simple as that, right? So there may be small situations that really uh, create a certain good emotion or a good feeling within us. Uh, mm -hmm. For some of us who may have children, when you see um, when you see something, when you're spending time with them, when you know you may see something uh, about them or something that they are. Um, showing or some stage that they are in creates a very positive emotion. Thank you so much. Okay, so let's look at the next one. Similarly, if you can recall a situation that brought about a negative emotion or a negative feeling that you experienced, any situation that created a negative emotion or a negative feeling, what was actually happening in that situation? Anybody else? Any one person? It's just personal sharing, okay? There's no right, wrong answers here. Any personal sharing. I'll share one. Yes, John. Yeah, so I think uh, 2018, uh, my um, mom's brother, um, he was not very old, uh, but he suddenly passed away. And at that time, uh, the, I was very shocked to hear the news. And it's very saddened because we, uh, as a family, we were all praying that he would be saved, uh, you know, he would be born again. And suddenly when got the news, he was like, why? <laughs> it's so saddened. And why did it happen like this? Or why, did it, why so soon? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, so we all experience different kind of situations that could bring about a negative emotion or a negative feeling, right? Now, the reason why I bought these two um, issues was to help us understand that um, it is it is normal to feel both positive as well as emotions that may be more than me calling it negative, I'll call them signal emotions that are emotions that tend to create a lot more of disturbance, right? So that we call that signal emotions. So there, there can be, it is normal to experience this. So depending on the situation, depending on how we think, how we perceive a situation, uh, it can create a certain emotion. Now, 
every situation may not create similar responses for everybody. That's because the way that we uh, perceive a situation, like for example, maybe someone who, um, you know, who gets maybe a new job or a new, let's say maybe a new car or, a, or something new, the way that we express or feel our emotions could vary. All right. And that is a lot to do. There are many factors that uh, that create that sense of that that emotional response. OK. Uh, and uh, it, it's a it's a normal, normal uh, spectrum that you see. Nevertheless, there are certain things that we got to keep in mind when we are talking about this broad topic of mental health. OK. Um, so I, I want to, first of all, let's let's look uh, clearly about when we're talking about mental health, what exactly are we are, are we um, are we bringing about or what what do we think encompasses this mental health? So to have a positive or a good mental health is a delicate balancing act. And there are many factors that make up our mental well-being. And it is from personal to social life, to your occupational life, to even your spirituality. Okay, So when certain areas of your life uh, turn to get out of balance, it can lead to the mental health being affected. This is especially true for those who are actually living with some kind of a mental illness all right now mental illness which i'm going to be talking about later uh, is another layer to this balancing act of keeping good mental health okay so and that's why there are many tools or many techniques that uh, that are taught to help manage one's mental well-being and because it it helps you to um, to do something proactively to make adjustments in some areas of your life so that you can experience a better well-being. Okay. Now, what we see over here is called the wellness wheel. Now, it's a very simple, it's a useful resource uh, to look at the various aspects of life that may affect our mental health. So what exactly is this uh, wellness wheel and how can we use this to work on our mental health and our wellness? So when, when we look at wellness, it is the concept of a good mental health uh, and the absence of some distress or illness when you're looking at wellness. Okay? So reaching a place of wellness may not always be straightforward. Um, and and sometimes in that journey, you may not have any signpost that says that you have arrived there. Okay, so there is not just a single pathway to well-being, uh, but you know it is something that we 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 call we say is collective or what we what we recognize as the as the multifaceted approach. That is, there are different facets to this wellness that we are talking about. So it, it when we're looking at it, it gives you you know visual understanding that what are the different factors that affect your mental health so it also helps us to make healthy decisions that contribute to a balanced uh, um, and a meaningful life so there are eight dimensions to this wellness wheel and here you will see there's physical wellness emotional wellness intellectual wellness social wellness environmental wellness occupational wellness financial wellness and spiritual wellness. So if you if if you look at these dimensions, each of them contribute to your mental health. Okay. So let's look at one of one uh, some of them uh, one by one. Now, physical wellness is something that holds your overall mental health. That is, you know, this is a casing that you have. You know, the body that we see is a casing, and caring for our body and listening to the cues it gives are vital parts of maintaining this aspect of mental health. When we neglect our physical wellness, it can, uh, can cause things like poor sleep quality. It can bring about illness. It can bring about um, injuries. It can bring about abuse. So one of the things is, yes, eating good food, exercising regularly, maintaining a consistent sleep sh schedule, 
all consist to positive physical wellness. And that's something like, like we are called to take care of our body. Our body is the temple of God and we are to take care of the casing that, that we have. Because um, you would have noticed, you know, let's say if any of you have gone through a period of illness for a certain period of time, it, it affects the way that you feel, it affects the way that you think, it affects the way that you pray. Your physical well-being is significantly important. The next we can look at is um, emotional uh, emotional wellness. Um, the To understand that our emotions affect everything from our mood and even to the way or our mindset that we have and the way that we look on the world. So what is emotional wellness consists of? It consists of our thoughts, it consists of our emotions, and our capabilities to deal with challenges that come in our lives. When our emotional selves are struggling, we have a very hard time to feel happy, to feel content, or uh, we, we have a hard time just sharing how uh, how we're doing with, with maybe other people or even the ability to relax. But when you are emotionally doing well, you can experience your emo emotions as they are while still feeling good about yourself. So which means having an awareness about the emotions and the thoughts that take uh, take our minds, okay? So we, we looked at physical, we looked at um, emotional uh, emotional aspect of it. The next one that we look at is the intellectual uh, wellness. Now this is uh, a intellectual, uh, this, this dimension doesn't mean you have to become a genius. It doesn't mean you have to have a high IQ, uh, intelligent quotient, you know, you have to do everything well. It just simply refers to being able to engage in things that are stimulating and creative that uh, and doing something that's creative that will engage your mind. So that can be in the form of work. It can be in the form of a vocation. It can be form of a passion. It can be anything. So it means you're able to think critically. You're open to new ideas. You're looking for outlets and solutions in your life. So the science of intellectual wellness actually includes having a, a strong understanding, awareness of what, uh, what, what you're good at or what, what values you live by or what abilities uh, you have. Uh, and also to question your opinions and um, issues of yourself. So that's what we mean by intellectual awareness. Uh, wellness. Not that you know you have to be perfect, perfect, and the best in your field. It just it doesn't mean that. It's just being able to be doing things that stimulate your uh, intellect. Okay, stimulate your reasoning, stimulate your ability to judge. Okay. Next is the social wellness. Social wellness uh, involves our connections between us, our family, our friends, our colleagues, our acquaintances, uh, anyone else in your life. Now, having good, strong relationships makes a very positive, uh, big difference to your mental health. When your social wellness is strong, you can communicate easily. You can be in a group, uh, within a group of people. You can develop relationship with others. And there are much more things that happen when you are socially connected with people, okay? So that, that again is important. Now, even when we're talking about social connections, there may be different kinds of people needing different kinds of connection. There may be a set of people who, who are okay to have many connections or many net support networks. There may be the others who are satisfied with few good uh, and deep relationships. All of that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter the quantity. It just matters the quality of relationships people share and, and the need to have others in one's life. Okay. Are you all, all here with me? Yes. Because there's so much of silence. Just a thumbs up or a hands up. I know that everyone's okay and, and here. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, okay, all right. Okay, so let's move on. The next is uh, occupational wellness. This, again, is another dimension. Um, and, and this means working in something that brings meaning and purpose to the work that you do. So if you work in a place 
or working in an area that doesn't make you um, uh, feel a sense of usefulness or satisfaction, it can bring you down and leave feelings that you're wasting your time. But when you're dedicated to that occupation or vocation, you're doing that work uh, that actually interests and motivates you to work hard and do your best. So to be able to be involved in some activity or the other, uh, which can be occupational. Now, it doesn't mean this needs to be paying you. Like, for example, let's say um, uh, maybe homemakers or young mothers uh, or uh, women who may not be employed. It doesn't matter. It's just doing something, working in something that gives you a meaning and purpose. OK, the, the next one is financial wellness. Although money isn't everything, having money definitely is a necessity for life. And money sometimes can become a, a huge stressor and a lack, severe lack of it can have a very serious impact on your mental health. So dedicating to dedication to a financial wellness definitely gives you a chance at eliminating financial stress as much as possible. So financial wellness, what does it involve? It involves making responsible choices about your living within your means or even contributing to, to different things in, in your life. Okay, So um, th that's what we mean by financial, financial wellness. Let's look at environmental wellness. Environmental wellness, what it means, it refers to your surroundings. That is from your personal as well as to your professional or your ministerial life. Maintaining positive environment wellness means uh, being aware of the spaces that you spend your time in. That is, if you're surrounded by negativity and stress, it is definitely going to cause your mental health to suffer. On the other hand, when you're, when you're engaged, when you're motivated, it, it uh, eases uh, um, uh, despite the difficulties and challenges. So some examples, like I'm saying, is let's say if, if a person is living in an extremely crowded housing, right? There is, if there's one room and there are 20 people living in that room. There is absolutely no space for anything. That can create a sense of a uh, burden on mental health. Or you're living in an office space where... Um, where there isn't any communication, where there is toxicity there, that can cause mental mental health issues. Or maybe in a relationship that is very burdening, that's it's there, where there is abuse or where there is um, either physical or emotional, any form of abuse that comes, that can create a, a definite stress to the mental health. And of course, spiritual wellness. It is, it's that which involves um, the, the, the ability to build that uh, relationship with God, uh, um, it, it, it brings about uh, building your beliefs and values that matter to, to a person and to recognize what is the purpose uh, God has for them. So dedicating that time to cultivate in spiritual wellness is, is very important. Now, now, when you're looking at it, you know, outside of uh, Christianity or outside of, of our personal belief in our relationship. This thing about spiritual wellness sometimes takes in very different kinds of meanings, right? It's it's about uh, just being self-aware or just uh, um, there, there are many aspects to it, okay, uh, that, that others may believe in. For our understanding, we know that having a relationship with the true God, with the Almighty God, is something that creates a whole lot of balance for us, even in the rest of our lives. So these are the eight aspects that we, we, we want to look at. Now, moving forward, uh, there, are certain, uh, there are certain factors that affect a person's mental health. We, I was, I was, I, what I did tell you was the was the different uh, um, the the wheel, the wellness that comes. But when we look at mental health issues, we see that there are different factors that can contribute to mental uh, health issues. So if we're looking at it biologically, uh, research has shown uh, th that th sometimes there are illnesses that come as a result of neurochemical changes in the brain. And as a result, there can be uh, uh, certain mood symptoms, certain thought symptoms, behavioral issues that can come. There can be a genetic predisposition, that is, you know, family 
um, uh, family history. If someone does have uh, uh, um, uh, a, a certain illness, it's being passed on. So there is a genetic disposition. That is, you are liable to have a certain condition because you know your parents have had, and that's something that doctors will check. Medication side effects, or there can be um, the fact that there is there is a lack of physical exercise and nutrition can also cause mental health issues. Developmental issues from the time a, a, a child is born, if developmental stages or milestones aren't um, uh, aren't in place, there, there there can be mental health issues. So these are these are what you call as biological lots. Uh, many things that's that's concerned with the body. Uh, I, and I haven't mentioned a few here, is also brain uh, brain issues, you know, or organic causes. That is, maybe there are structural changes in the brain. Maybe somebody meets with an accident, and as a result, there are mental health conditions that happen. Or there may be tumors <clears throat> that cause mental health issues. So that's what we look at in the biological aspect. The next we look at is psychological. Psychological has everything to do, in, in our understanding, has everything to do with the soul, the way that a person identifies themselves, the kind of self esteem that's been built, the self acceptance that they that has come about, the way that their temperaments have grown, their personality has, has come about. Then comes an emotional health. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, then comes emotional health, the way that we are aware of our emotional responses, the way that we regulate our emotional responses and maintain our emotional responses. The others can include cognitive factors, that is the way that our thought processes go. You know, how do we think? Uh, what, are, what are the ways that we, what are our belief systems? What are our perceptions? All of this affect, uh, these are part of our psychological processes, the things that happen in our mind, in our will, and in our intellect, okay? Then there can be behavioral factors, there can be coping skills, how people uh, um, manage stress, uh, what what do they do when there are crises that happens? How how do they generally cope? And last, of course, is to have a sense of meaning and a sense of purpose in their lives. Now, all of this comes under the psychological part of it. And over here, there's a lot to do with spirituality also, the way that they connect to uh, to the to God and the way that they build that relationship with God. So these factors also affect mental health. And lastly, it is the social factors. So your culture, the kind of culture you may you may be born in, the certain beliefs, both cultural as well as religious beliefs that a person has, the kind of support system that they have, the people that uh, involve uh, that are uh, that are part of their network, that can be a factor. Gender identity, identity, the way that they see themselves, um, uh, the, the kind of gender preferences that they take, the the um, the um, acceptance of. Of, of gender. Now, all of this this definitely plays plays a role. Then, other kind of social factors are upbringing, family family background, what has happened initially in the family background, the trauma that's that's probably there, the kind of uh, uh, situations that's happened in their social existence. Then, other things are employment status, sexual orientation. What kind of orientation are they are they having that could add in a lot more stress than what is actually designed? Or socioeconomic status, um, and of course, disability. So these are some these are some things that that brings about factors that affect uh, affect mental health. Now, I'm I'm just going to quickly go through some statements, and if you all can, if you all are able to quickly respond, because I have a quite a few, just to understand if they are myth or fact, okay? So mental illnesses are untreatable. Is Do you think it's a fact or it's a myth? Okay, I'm going to keep going on, others will never finish, okay? So mental illnesses are treatable. There are uh, ways that you can, there are, uh, there is help both, uh, um, both with medication, with uh, counseling, and of course with spiritual 
uh, deliverance, mental illnesses are absolutely treatable. Lack of willpower causes mental illness. That uh, mental illness has nothing to do with willpower. Okay, people, uh, anyone, even maybe this one so-called the strongest person with willpower, the least person with willpower can can have a mental illness. Okay, marriage can cure mental illness. Okay, I'd, I'd like some responses on this one. Maybe I'll look for responses on a few. Can marriage uh, 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 cure mental illness? No, marriage cannot cure. <laughs> okay. Yes, marriage cannot cure mental illness. Um, in, yes, it, that's a myth. Yeah, because in fact, if you see, you know, there is a there is a stressor scale that's there, and marriage, uh, of course, death is the highest uh, stress level, which which uh, counts to a hundred. You know, if you're looking from zero to a hundred, marriage, um, sorry, death comes at hundred. Marriage comes actually at a fifty. And uh, uh, and you know change of work, uh, uh, change of uh, a job, uh, sorry, change of job, change of a housing, all comes under that place of 50, 60 stress level because you know there are different things that's required in a person's life when they're getting into marriage. So it doesn't cure mental mental illness. Uh, so it's a myth if people say that you know mental illness will sort the person's. Uh, issues. Okay. Mental ill patients belong to hospitals. That's untrue. Uh, people may require uh, for a brief period of time to get uh, support from a hospital, but they do not belong to hospitals. They can actually come back home, uh, get back into a job, depending on the kind of illness that they have. Um, if treated early, if helped early, they definitely can get the best support possible. Mental health problems are only seen in illiterate or poor people. That again is true. Uh, mental health problems is not a respecter of people. It's not a respecter of caste, creed, uh, respecter of economic status, none of that. Okay. Uh, next. Yeah. Okay. People with mental illness can never be productive or do normal work like normal people. Uh, that again, again, is a myth um, that people with mental illness definitely can get back to working, uh, to leading a normal life like others if they do get the support and the help that they that they require and they need. If mental illness is um, uh, uh, looked into as early as possible the outcome is seen to be much, much better. Okay, Mental illness is unlike physical illness. The illness is really all in the person's head. That's not true. It's not something that the person is making up. It's something that can uh, be very real. And uh, it, it, it's a reality for them when they are in there. So they definitely require empathy, require support, require help, um, require an understanding in working through these issues. Mentally ill people have weak characters since they can't cope with the world in the same way that the rest of us do. Uh, again, that's not true. Uh, then it, this has nothing to do. Mental illness has nothing to do with the uh, with the, with the character frame of a person N nevertheless the choices people make can definitely affect their mental health so someone who makes uh, poor choices like for for example someone who is um, abusing their body with with substances who may be in uh, significantly bad relationships multiple relationships people who do not uh, um, have a, a purposeful activity to do. Now, the certain choices that, that people make can affect their mental health. OK? Uh, any questions here? I have one more slide. OK. So once a psychiatric patient, always a psychiatric patient. Again, not true. Uh, once a psychiatric patient, once they're helped, you know, they can come to become as normal as possible. Children don't suffer from psychiatric illnesses. That, again, is false. Children also can have uh, similar disorders and illnesses that you see even in adults, whether it be mood disorders, whether it be uh, like depression, whether it be more um, uh, major mental health issues like schizophrenia. These may be names you have heard, uh, but these, these all affect uh, children. Uh, anxiety, 
uh, OCD, that's obsessive compulsive disorders, all of this can affect even children. Okay, mental health disorders are a result of bad parenting. Okay, this is something I'd like to maybe uh, stop to hear some comments. Is it a result of bad parenting? Is it a myth or a fact? I think not necessarily. Mm -hmm. it, uh, bad parenting also could result in some uh, mental issues. Okay. Uh, but eventually, uh, it also depends on that person's trauma or uh, change in their hormones or anything of that sort. Absolutely. Yes. So it can contribute. Uh, um, a bad childhood, bad parenting definitely can contribute to somebody's mental health, but it cannot. It may not be a direct cause of a mental illness. There could be many, many factors. So uh, some of these are proven, especially, you know, when you have uh, twins in a home where, where there are significant, uh, um, let's say, abuse or, or neglect from a certain, from, from, from parents or from the caretakers, you may see that one of them could go down a mental health issue, whereas the other it, it seems to be, um, uh, you know, well balanced, well adjusted, and this is what indicates that you know it also personality, it's also um, the mental framework, uh, the kind of um, uh, the kind of support that they have received, uh, being able to cope with these issues. So there are multiple factors. It's just not a single factor. Okay, good. Um, let's move on to the next one. Uh, mental health illness uh, illnesses are contagious. It isn't. It's not like COVID. It's not like uh, uh, anything, anything else that if you sneeze or if you sit next to somebody, eat from their plates, that you will get uh, mental illness. Okay, it, it, it just isn't a way of, uh, uh, it, it doesn't spread that way. Attempting suicide is a sign of cowardice. Okay, I'd like to hear some thoughts on this one. <laughs> Attempting suicide is a sign of cowardice. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead, uh, Lubega. I can say to uh, the greatest extent, yes, it's a fact. Okay, you say it's a fact. Okay, anybody else thinks otherwise? I don't think it's a sign of cowardice, but. Um, being uh, frightened about what to do next could be a reason, but uh, attempting suicide is an extreme form of uh, uh, lack of self-worth and understanding about ourselves. Okay, thank you. Right. So, um, uh, so many times, if you look at statistics, suicide usually is attempted because of a mental health issue either because of depression or because of other mental health concerns like schizophrenia, substance use. So uh, depression can come secondary to a mental health, uh, sorry, a suicide can be secondary to another mental health condition. So very often, and, and there is a statistic to it, and we're going to be talking about suicide separately, so I'll, I'll bring those statistics then. Um, uh, but there are, yes, other causes of uh, suicide, which could be uh, adjustment issues, issues in relationships, um, uh, significant trauma that happens, impulsivity that takes place. So some of this, uh, and, and as, as uh, Pastor John did say, it comes as, a, as an inability to know that there are coping, that they can cope with it, inability to see beyond um, what is imminent for them okay so it, sometimes it's it's a huge um uh it's it's it, it takes a lot for a person to actually come to a place of suicide because in, in, if you look at some reports uh, that you see a lot of those who attempted and completed an act of suicide comes from maybe uh, days or months of planning right to, to to come to that place so it it could it could be as a result of what they've been preparing themselves to do nevertheless 
um, it is it's an extremely sad um, place to be in. It just uh, just shows a huge sense of loneliness, a huge sense of despondency and hopelessness in that in that area. Okay, and that's that's what we need to be aware of. That uh, someone who's attempting contemplating suicide definitely needs empathy, definitely needs warmth, definitely needs a place of understanding. Okay. Next one, mentally ill patients are violent and dangerous. Again, not all mentally ill patients are violent and dangerous. Sometimes when they are at the peak of their episodes of uh, uh, health issues, that they can be violent towards themselves and towards others. But otherwise, when they, uh, and usually it comes because of wrong uh, thoughts and perceptions that they are having. And it's like a sense to protect themselves that they feel, um, you know, they need to they need to protect themselves and as a result may get violent. But they're not always violent and dangerous. If they get the help they need, they are able to manage. Okay, I need, uh, I need um, uh, the next one. Mentally ill means the person has a lack of faith. Uh, I need some thoughts on this. What are your thoughts? Yes, somebody else. Uh, I think Pastor John and Lubega and Divya have been. Um, someone else would like to speak? Rosalind? Paul? Success? Anita? The silence. Nobody wants to take the, come on. Okay, uh, do any of you agree with this? Okay, Divya said it's a myth. Does anyone say it's a fact? At least I write that. So at least I know what your thoughts are. Does anyone say it's a fact? You know, it's you should myth. either, it's a myth, okay. You should either be on this side or that side. You know, God spews out lukewarm people from his mouth, no? So you have to make a choice, either here or either there. Okay, so uh, mentally ill pe people, it does not mean that they uh, they do not have faith, okay? Uh, there is there's nothing, um, there's, there's no indication, nothing that says that someone who is ill is because they have a lack of faith, and and that's something I think we uh, we need we need to be sensitive about as we reach out to people, um, because this is um, this is something mental health issues are 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 is a condition that you will see in the church as well, right? Among people who may be worshiping alongside with you. And to label them as people with a lack of faith or a trust in God or a relationship with God can, in fact, bring them to a very, they can get burnt, you know, they can get church burnt and um, can move them away from, from, uh, from understanding what actually love means. So being careful and sensitive to the fact that this has nothing to do with their ability to stand in faith or not. Okay. All right, let's move forward. Okay, so just quickly to understand. Oh my, I think we are we are at an hour. Okay, uh, so we'll we'll move into this after uh, after the break. It's ten fifty uh, to ten fifty one. We will resume back at eleven one. We'll see you in ten minutes.